1969 was the best summer of my life. I spent it on the Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry, on the west coast of Ireland. That's me in red with my cousin Robert O'Toole in West Kerry during that summer. I was there because this man, my uncle, Buddy O'Toole, was working on a film called Ryan's Daughter. Buddy spent his entire life working in the film industry. In September 2012, 43 years later, Buddy and myself returned to Dingle. It was a nostalgic trip for both of us to go back to West Kerry after so many years. On our way there, we stopped at Inch Beach, where many of the scenes from Ryan's daughter were filmed. When we got to Dingle, we could hardly recognise it from the place we remembered. It is now a vibrant tourist town, buzzing with activity. Ryan's Daughter was directed and edited by the famous director David Lean, with whom Buddy had previously worked. I came here because we wanted a wild place, and I like wild places. And I think this west coast of Ireland is one of the most beautiful wild places I've ever seen. This was a big budget film and large sets were built, including a village 1,000 feet up on the side of a mountain. The village included 29 houses, a pub, shop, church and police station. Because of the Atlantic winds and weather in this part of Ireland, the sets were built solidly from stone. Unlike most film sets, which are usually flimsy and not meant to last very long. The sets took six months to build and provided employment for many local people. So with David Lean as well on my side, Ryan's daughter came along and here I am, back again, back in my own country, in Kerry. Dingle in 1969 was a sleepy little backwater and the people of the town had no idea of what was about to hit them. A large cast and crew were about to arrive and they would require accommodation, food, cars and drivers. The unit would also require various buildings to accommodate props, editing rooms, publicity office and all of the other space required by a large on-location film production. They would also require a lot of local people as extras, cast and crew. Dingle was unknown at that time. There was plenty of pubs in Dingle but few customers. When the Dublin crowd came down, all the actors and construction buds and God knows what, it was livened up at night time. The pubs were full up. Oh, geez. It was something there. It was like Christmas Eve there every night. Things started changing, Dingle, then. Things started looking up. Everybody started earning money. Tom Ash would do all sorts of things for us. Ribs, he'd done ribs during the day, scallops, and he was very good. There were other pubs that the film crew kind of adopted. Uh, was Tom Long's one of those pubs? Oh, Tom Long, yes. He was, uh, he was down in the front. Uh, Tom Long, and there was another guy with him as well. The Bond, they used to call him The Bond. Really? <laughs> the Bond. They never say Paddy Bond, Blossom, they used to say The Bond. Peg Sugru, she was a great character altogether. And Pod was the, the husband. He worked in the boat yard. And uh, he'd be the lookout man at night time when we were all drinking after hours and there with the lights out and that. And he'd be sitting on a stool up in the window with the curtains pulled behind him. And one night he was there and he fell asleep and fell off the stool. And he made a hell of a row we did. And everybody thought it was the girls coming. They all flew out the back door. <laughs> They're going in all directions out the back door. They said, for Christ's sake, come in, the malice. The malice, <laughs> he's hurt himself, he's on the floor. <laughs> oh, Pat, that was funny, that. Who did you work with on Ryan's Daughter in terms of local people, Kerry people? Who did, who did you work with there? Two. 
great friends of mine. They were forevermore my friends. There was Jim McKenna. He was the carpenter. He was with us all the time, Jim. His son, Pawdy. We had a house on the Slay Head Road. And it was lovely. All the family came up from Waterford to visit. And they all enjoyed it. Sarah was lovely, great character. Sarah was great. She, she was one of the lads, put it that way. Really? Yeah, she was one of the lads. John Mills was a nice man, nice man. He had his wife with him all the time, Haley Bell. And uh, she looked after him and she liked a, a bevy herself, a nice drink, <laughs> whatever. But she was a funny guy. If he got a lot of drink down him, you had to be careful. You couldn't be too familiar with him. He might give you one across the ear roll or something like that. You never know. You just avoided him when he had too many down him. When he was sober, he was great. When I went on Chivago and uh, I was uh, picked to do standby, that's stand with the camera and do all the business as required. I was working with Lean for a month before he even recognised me. Now, I'd never met the man before in my life, but he was observing all the time. And at the end of a month, he came to me in the studio one day and he said, welcome, he said, aboard. That's the words he meant, welcome aboard, he said. And after that, he used to call me by my name. Buddy met up with his old friend, Paulie McKenna, on Dingle Pier. Although he is known to his family and friends as Buddy, he is known by everybody he worked with in the film industry as Mickey. Consequently, everybody we met in Dingle called him Mickey. With Paulie's help, we went to visit some of the old locations, including the schoolhouse and the village. It was sad to see this once beautiful building now reduced to its current state of disrepair. It was nostalgic for Buddy to visit the place again after so many years. He had spent a lot of happy days there working with the cast and crew making the film. Memories, oh memories, years of long ago. Fuck it, sing up. One night we were doing a late shot, sunset, which Lean loves. He loves the sunset and the sunrise. And we had Mitchum here, and it was late at night time. The sun goes down here about 10 o'clock or sometime. And he was pissed off. And everybody was gathered around waiting for the sun to be in the right position to shoot. Mitchum walked out the doorway and he looked around and he saw the producer and director and he shouted, I get a strong smell of <laughs> he said. <laughs> Everybody stood still and looked. And the next thing is, Lean looked at the producer and said, I don't smell nothing, he said to you. <laughs> and everybody started fucking laughing at him. <laughs> That's how it finished. Where's the seagull, man? That was me. Get the, sea, get the seagulls out. I used to get seagulls out of the, the Atlantic, South Atlantic and North Atlantic, at a minute's notice. They'd come out and they used to, I think they recognised me as well. David Lean was a most particular director. 
Often the cast and crew stood around for hours and sometimes days while he waited for the right light or pondered the exact details of a scene. He particularly liked seagulls while they were shooting Ryan's daughter. Our next port of call was the site of the village. This had been the main location for the film. I clearly remember the first time Buddy took us up there all those years ago. I was absolutely amazed to see the actors and crew, all the cameras, lights and equipment, in the perfect little village perched on the side of the mountain. We were privileged to be allowed up there at all during that time. No members of the public were allowed to visit and the place had 24-hour security. When the filming was completed, the film company offered the village to the Irish Tourist Board or to anybody else who would take it for free. The reason they offered the village for free was that unless it was taken over by somebody, the film company would have had to demolish it and completely remove it from the mountain. Sadly, for one reason or another, the offer was not taken up and the beautiful village was demolished. Now all that remains of the village are the cobblestones on the mountainside. I found it incredible that nobody was prepared to take on the village. It would surely have been a wonderful tourist attraction for the area. After the release of the film, many thousands of visitors descended on Dingle, looking to see the locations where the film had been made. I think our director of photography on this film, Anthony Kelly, summed it up when he said, they didn't need the village. The rugged beauty of West Kerry and its people attract millions of visitors each year, and the Dingle Peninsula is one of Ireland's most popular tourist destinations. That summer in Dingle had a profound effect on me and I developed a huge interest in filmmaking. Soon after I left Dingle, I had my first 8mm movie camera. I started to make my own films and I have been doing it ever since. Had it not been for that magical summer I spent in Dingle with Buddy and his family, none of this would ever have happened. When we left the village, we travelled back to Dingle to meet up with some of the other members of the cast and crew of Ryan's daughter. Frank, what would be your recollection of uh, the first time you met up with Mickey O'Toole? Well, I suppose the first time I met him would be up at the village. He worked in the props and uh, I was next door with the wardrobe. But a, a neighbour of mine worked with him. So, day by day, I got eventually in contact with Mickey. So when Mickey got to know a few of the local guys in with us, we used to socialise in the same pub by night. And then, then Danny needed him a comedian, we had him. Unpaid. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was the best, the best thing that ever happened in England to run the other room there. Because the, the, there was no money there that him. <coughs> the labouring men that him before they came <coughs> in the two yards, it was Fitzy's and well, Blatchford's first foot party brought it in, and Atkins's. Ten bob a day, six days a week, I was eight three pound. How oh, they never got it, they live. How much did you get paid on Ryan's daughter? Oh, uh, 40 pound a week I had. 40 pound a For, week? 40 pound a week. It was great money that him. Young Dan O'Keefe from Dingle was cast in the role of the altar boy for the Rosie Ryan wedding scene in Ryan's Daughter. In my innocence, I thought I was at a real wedding. You serious? I did, of course. At one, at one stage, um, <laughs> David Liam came up to me looking for... I had a, the plate and the ring. And he came up he was changing something anyway, and he says to me, um, where's the ring? So I just looked at him and I says, um, Mrs Mitchum has it. <laughs> in pure innocence, I... Really? Yeah. <laughs> but sure, what could you do? Like at yeah, yeah. 10 to 11 years of age. I swear, though. Especially in the Ireland of that time. Yes. Did you get paid for your job? I did. did I'm not telling you how much. Oh, he, he, tax, you taxman never got a penny of that. He, ha <laughs> he, he has it yet. <laughs> he has it yet. 20, it. 25 pounds. It was 5 pounds a day. What was your involvement with Ryan's daughter? I was working under Mickey um, with the standby props. We were standby camera crew. And how, how did you get involved? When we had this film was coming around, work was, wasn't very plentiful at the time. Well, it, it was and it wasn't, but we had this thing. It might be a good thing to be involved in. So I think my father met John Moore. And John Moore and Captain Kelly would employ the local, we say, workforce. Asked him for a job and there you were. We got a job just like that. 
That was it. Yeah. All too soon our visit to Dingle was over. It was nostalgic, but we enjoyed it immensely and look forward to our return there. Buddy, what is your date of birth? 23rd of August, 1929. What were your parents' names? Michael O'Toole. Yeah. And uh, the maiden name of my mother was uh, Mary Ellen Hennessy. And uh, they were married in 1926 in the cathedral. What was your father's occupation? He was uh, in the print. He was a printer? Yes. Where did he work? He worked for the Kerryman in later years, yes. in Tralee. Right. He had what they called galloping consumption, TB in other words. The poor man was only 35 years of age when he succumbed to the fatal lung disease that was prevalent in Watford and in Ireland. I was very young at the time, didn't realise my father was gone. The main source of uh, income had gone with him because there was nobody working in the family. Madge was the oldest. She was around 10, I think. And Nancy was coming up behind her at uh, seven, eight. Then Jackie after me and Helen. They were the five. So Mary arrived on the scene and now nobody could afford a cot in those days. So Mary finished up in an orange box. Nancy worked in the bulb factory, they called it, in the Glen. Really? Yes, it was uh, at the bottom of the Glen, uh, next to the Regal, the entrance to the Regal Gallery. Mary, seen here on the right, worked in Denny's meat factory, as did Helen. Mary went on to do nursing and now lives in New York. Helen moved to London, but moved back to Waterford with her family when she retired. Match was all the time knitting jumpers and gloves, which was a, a very delicate operation. But she used to be knitting all the time, and I think she got the idea of knitting from the job she had in Lindsay's in George Street, or O'Connell Street he was, Lindsay. He had a haberdasher's shop down there, a small business. She didn't stay there all that long, and then she went into nursing. Where and when did you meet Hesse? In the Olympia, about 1945. That's where I first gazed at Hesse. I joined the army in 1946. Anyway, I came out of the army in 1949. And I was on the boat the same month. They were all there to say goodbye. And that, mind you, we were all tanked up as well. We, we were in the Royal Oak before we went to the boat, which was leaving at six o'clock or sometime. And we, we all got tanked up in there. So it was a, a, a merry old time before we got on the boat. Mind you, there was about 200 or 300 cattle in there before us. And all the, you could hear was moon and moon and moon all the time. It was a horrendous. Uh, boat to travel on. They had more passengers than it was built for. Yeah. And they got as many people on. They were making a fortune with the Great Western. It was coming and going all the time with passengers. Most people were standing still all the way across. I uh, got a job in Park Lane re uh, doing bomb damage. A place was being rebuilt after being bombed during the war. How did you get involved in the film industry? How did that happen? Yeah, I used to go to Barnet on weekends. I had a cousin in Barnet, and her husband, Tommy Early, he, he was a County Clare man, came out of the Parachute Regiment and into the studios, Borough Wood, MGM Studios. Quite a big studio there. He said to me one weekend, you know, he said they're recruiting guys up there, he said, for props. Would you like to have a go? I said, certainly. I said, I'll do anything, I said, to get away. And I went to uh, Barnet on the Monday morning and accompanied Tom out of the studios. And he introduced me into the personnel department and signed up. 
and uh, I was on the books. Irish dance halls all around the place. And uh, we, we, used to, we used to go to the dance halls, enjoy ourselves, and there were lots of Irish girls there we knew, who came from Waltford as well. And uh, it was just like the Olympia was transferred to Kilburn or someplace. Really? So there was, there was all sorts there from the west of Ireland and from uh, southern Ireland, Dublin, any part of Ireland. And then you had Cricklewood, the Galtymore and Cricklewood, another great uh, place to, to meet people. They were more, I think they were all more or less west of Ireland, the Galtymore. That was a great uh, place for meeting people from Galway and Roscommon and Mayo and that. During Buddy's early years, he worked mainly on studio films in the London area. Uh, did you like working in the industry? You know, when you went to work with MGM, was it a job that you liked doing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You couldn't but like it. You got up in the morning and you, you couldn't get to work quick enough because it was such a, an easy, well, sometimes easy and a lovely job and you didn't work too hard, but you had to give your whole self to it and be... Uh, very attentive to the commands of the director who's done the shouting and the assistant director he's made. So you had to be on the ball all the time. I came back to Waterford and got married in Ballybricken in 1953. I got married at uh, eight o'clock in the morning and total darkness. And your brother Jackie was married on the same day. The same day. day. He was married in St John's. The same day to Margot. Where, where was the first place you lived when you went back to London together? Well, we lived in uh, uh, first place Woodside Park, North London. I had got uh, an attic room for two pound a week. A miserable bastard who was looking after the, 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 the room as well, the, out the lodging house. Pretty soon Buddy was travelling all over the world. Zarek Khan was shot in Spanish Morocco in 1957. Sea Wife with Richard Burton and Joan Collins was shot in Jamaica in 1956. Although relatively unknown at the time, Richard Burton went on to become a huge Hollywood star and famously married the actress Elizabeth Taylor twice. One such film was the award-winning The Inn of the Sixth Happiness, starring Ingrid Bergman, Robert Donat and Kurt Jurgens. During my research, I was delighted to find a rare British Pathé newsreel about the making of that film, and guess who popped up in the middle of it? Stars and 2,000 extras, mainly from London's Chinese restaurants, in case you think you recognise some of them. In this film, Ingrid Bergman plays the real-life role of an Englishwoman who went to China as assistant to a missionary. Light in the Piazza with Olivia de Havilland and Rosano Brazzi was shot in Rome and Florence in 1961. Chalico with Bridget Bardot and Sean Connery was shot in Spain in 1968. It wasn't all plain sailing and there was very often a lot of pressure on the props department. Sometimes Buddy literally had to work with a gun to his head. Buddy is seen here with Shirley Eden, the famous golden girl from the James Bond film Goldfinger. In 1960, he worked with two of the biggest stars of the time. Millionaire S for studio, Sophie Loren and Peter Sellers. That was a show, a show play, The Millionaire S. Quite an interesting film to work on. In 1968, Buddy worked on a film called Where's Jack, which was shot at Ardmore Studios in Bray. Buddy's sister-in-law, Patty Reed, and her husband, John, appeared as extras in the film. The woman in the bonnet is Patty, and here she looks like she could have made it as a film star herself in Hollywood. 
In the meantime, family life went on and Buddy and Hesse had three children, Robert, Valerie and Peter. They also have four grandchildren and all are doing well. The films then started to go down because TV had taken over and the, the movie business then went to the, went to the floor. Nothing. I had an offer then to go to London Weekend Television. That was the London station that provided television for the weekend, starting Friday night until Mon uh, Sunday night. That was the, the weekend slot. And they had uh, an audience of uh, 10 million people or more in the London area. So it was a catchment area really for advertisers. On the buses, upstairs, downstairs, a bouquet of barbar. The Prisoner was a big one for you. Oh, The Prisoner. Was, that was made from MGM now, The Prisoner. And Patrick McGoon was excellent. You became very good friends with Pat. Oh, we were great friends. We were great friends. We, we, we loved each other and we enjoyed each other and we had a drink together now and again. And he was great. So I started with them in 1971, I think it was. And uh, I stayed with them until I retired completely in 1989. Uh, 60 years of age. I retired at 60. That was the age that they expect you to retire. But you could have gone on till 65. But they made an offer I couldn't refuse. They paid me a lump sum and paid my pension until I was 65, until the state took over. So that wasn't a bad deal. And I still went to work for five years after. So I was earning both pension, lump sum, and wage. How bad? I decided I'd sell up in London and come back to Ireland, which I did. I sold the house in London and bought a house in Collins Avenue, here on the Dunmore Road, and we're living happily ever after. Yeah, when I first went to Dingle, um, I was totally disappointed. I didn't actually want to be in Dingle because uh, I wanted to be out enjoying myself, you know, but when I got there, huge disappointment. There were no youth clubs. There was nothing for a teenager, as it were, a young teenager to do. So, no, I didn't want to be there. And of course, at that age, I didn't really appreciate the scenery that was around, which subsequently, having been back there, it's stunning. The whole place is stunning. My dad used to always wear sunglasses, right? And, uh, and, and so did my mum, actually. Um, so I used to think they were both blind, because I was wearing in sunglasses, but of course, it was a trendy thing to do in the 60s. And uh, suddenly, my mum, um, who, was all, who would always leave the sunglasses all over the place, was suddenly very protective of this particular pair of sunglasses. And it was only years later I found out they used to be Sophie Loren's sunglasses, because what had happened was um, my dad had been working on some film and she needed to wear sunglasses in the film. Sophie Loren uh, decided that she was going to take my dad around, um, all around London, or wherever the film was made. And he said she dragged me from pillar to post to buy a pair of sunglasses and bought the most expensive, trendiest pair of sunglasses she could lay her hands on, in the hope that at the end of the film, she'd walk away with them. And she did go down to the props department and ask for the sunglasses. And my dad said, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, they're props and then probably brought them home and gave them to me mum. <laughs> <laughs> so she's been wearing the sun sunglasses. Really? Yeah, That's truly, amazing. yeah. wonder does she still have them then? <laughs> no, I don't no. think so. No, 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 I don't no. think so. I rang up and my dad answered the phone and I said, uh, oh, Dad, hi, it's, it's me. I said, is Mum there? And he said, she'd not go. She's down at the church praying for the dead. And he said, no, I'm up here. They can starve. And he said, you think she'd look after the living? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, he's always got a quip. Tragically, Buddy passed away in January of 2013, just weeks after this film was completed. Before he died, he saw the film, and to use his own words, he enjoyed it immensely. Yeah.